Okay, let's look at Nietzsche's boundary penalty method as an application of uh, Strang's second lemma. This is actually closely related to the so-called interior penalty discontinuous Galerkin method. Also, it is a very nice flexible method to deal with arbitrary boundary conditions on the curved boundary. The model problem is just the Poisson equation with the homogeneous Dirichlet data. And so the energy space is h10. Uh, in general, we are thinking of a domain with curved boundary. So some of the triangles, triangles that are close to the boundary, will have curved edges. And we just want to use piecewise polynomials. So in this case, let's, for example, just say piecewise affine functions. And if you say, uh, because of this curved boundary, if you look at, for example, piecewise affine function on this curved triangle, which are zero on the on these two vertices, then that will be zero along this straight edge, uh, straight line. But in general, it's not going to be zero on the curved boundary part. So uh, we're going to impose boundary condition on this curved part by some kind of penalty term. And uh, so the space does not have boundary condition that is incorporated. The space is just piecewise affine functions without any condition on the boundary. The bilinear form, the discrete bilinear form is going to be this. So you see that the first part, that's, this is just the standard one. And here, this part is going to, uh, in particular, this the first part, this is going to impose the boundary condition. In this case, zero directly boundary condition. And this is just added so that we have a symmetric bilinear form. And the third term here, or, or the fourth term, uh, is added here for stability. So this is going to give us coercivity of the discrete bilinear form without harming the consistency. And this gamma h, this is going to be some large uh, positive constant that may depend on the uh, discrete space h, a uh, discrete space uh, xh. So in order to apply a strong second lemma, uh, what do we need? We need coercivity of the bilinear form in the discrete space xh. Of course, we want the coercivity constant to be independent of h. And we need the boundedness of this bilinear form now, not only in the discrete space xh cross xh, but actually we need to need this to be defined on x plus xh. So basically, functions of the form uh, some h10 function plus some piecewise affine function. The last condition is we need good bound on this term. This is going to be zero if ah was the exact bilinear form. And here u star is the exact solution of our original problem. And we also need to choose some appropriate norm on this space x plus xh. Okay, so let's look at coercivity first. Now, if you just substitute u in place of v, then a h u u will have this form here. Now, we want to show coercivity, so uh, we see that here there is one potentially uh, negative term so we want to bound that term okay so let's just look at this term use uh, young's inequality to bound with some arbitrary positive epsilon with the l2 norm squared of the normal derivative of u over the boundary and just l2 norm of u squared over the boundary and here we're going to have some negative power of epsilon then we can use uh, inverse inequality here. The inverse inequality of the type that bounds norms on the boundary by norms on the interior. So if you do that, we're going to you have to pay neg one negative power of h here because of this squared. What we're going to choose is you, you choose epsilon to be uh, h over c with some large constant c. Okay, so if you do that. This is going to be uh, independent of h, this product here, so that uh, by choosing c sufficiently large, we can actually uh, absorb this first term inside this positive term here, because we're going to have small pos positive constant in front. And now 
The second term here, of course, will have a very large constant in front, but that we, going, we are planning to bound by choosing gamma h very large. So if we just write this lower bound here, we have this. So we already applied, uh, already used that this constant is small. And the combination of the, the last two terms will give you gamma h minus some constant times negative power of h. So we choose gamma h to be something like uh, h to the power minus 1 uh, with some maybe large constant in front here. So by doing that, we will have positive constant in front of the L2 norm of, uh, of u squared on the boundary. This actually uh, informs us about the norm that we want to choose for the discrete space h. So this is actually going to be, this actually should be defined on x plus x h. So we just choose this discrete norm to be, if you forget about this exponent 2, we have h1 semi norm of u on, on the interior plus uh, negative half power of h times the L2 norm of u on the boundary, so that this is going to be our norm that we use. Okay, so we have coercivity, but if we choose gamma h to be of this form. Now, what about boundedness? So for boundedness, we need to bound a h u v by uh, something of this form, some constant times the h norm of u times h norm of v. Now, in order to do that, what we want to do is we want to actually uh, modify the definition of AH for the functions that are not in XH, okay? This is not going to change our uh, discrete solution because in the discrete Galerkin solution, AH is used only with, with UV uh, elements of XH. And this modification will only affect uh, AH UV when URV is not in xh. So what is this modification? This originally this was normal derivative of v and this was normal derivative of u. Now what we do is when u is not in xh we first take just the gradient of v then we then we project that gradient onto piecewise constants with respect to our finite element mesh. So it's going to be L2 orthogonal projections. So these are piecewise constants. Then we multiply, take the dot product with a unit normal vector. So you see that if u was an element of xh, that's a piecewise affine functions, the gradient is going to be piecewise constant anyway. So this projection is really not doing anything if u or v is in xh. It's not going to affect the, the finite element algorithm itself. It is only used, this modification, in theory. Now we start uh, estimating, so AHUV here, the first part here, that's just uh, Cauchy-Schwarz. We are denoting L2 norm by this norm without any uh, subscript, and L2 norm of the boundary by this. Again, this is just Cauchy-Schwarz on the boundary. We have the same kind of thing here that comes from that third term. And over here we have, again, Cauchy-Schwarz, gamma H times L2 norm of U and L2 norm of V on the boundary. Now we look at this term in combination with half of the last term here. So that's here. The L2 norm of u is common to both terms. So we take that out and we use the uh, inverse inequality. It's inverse trace inequality or discrete trace inequality to bound uh, L2 norm of the piecewise constants on the boundary by L2 norm of the, that piecewise constant on the interior and we have to pay negative half power of h. And after that, we use the uh, stability of these L2 projections so that we have we don't have bar here. This gamma h will have h minus 1, and you take one uh, uh, minus half of that and take that minus half outside the bracket, so that this minus half, half is that. Then what remains in the inside this bracket will be just the gradient of v plus h minus one half times the L2 norm of v on the boundary. So that's exactly h norm of v. And this part is of course bounded by h norm of u because it's just the second term in the, in the definition of h norm. So that is bounded by some constant times h norm of u times h norm of v. 
And this term uh, together with half of that can also be bounded in the same way. So that in the end, AHUV is bounded by the gradient terms plus these uh, H terms. And of course, these gradient terms are bounded by the corresponding H norms, because this is just part of the definition of H norm. So that's boundedness. Now we look at consistency. So for consistency, we need to look at this expression. We need to have a good bound on that. And V is going to be an arbitrary element from our piecewise affine finite element space. So let's just substitute what is AH here. So we have that, that's the first term. And here we have this consistency term where V is in XH, so we don't need to have bar here. Uh, but over here, because U star is not necessarily in the finite element space, that's the exact solution. We're going to have that modification here. And that's the penalty term. Now, if we do integration by parts here, we're going to have the Laplacian of U star. And that's exactly the exact equation. So U star satisfies the exact equation uh, on the, in the domain. So this is going to be zero. And from the integration by parts, there is going to be uh, one term that is on the boundary. And that term is here. And this term can be combined with that symmetry term to give you this. And over here now, this remaining consistency term is combined with the stability term over, over here. Now, the consistency term and the stability term becomes zero on the exact solution because this exact solution is zero on the boundary. So this term is completely zero. So the only thing we need to look at is this term that comes from the symmetry and the integration by parts of this first term. So uh, one can show that this is bounded by h to the power half times the h2 norm of u star. So you can think of it in this way. Uh, first, you bound this L2 norm of that difference on the boundary by H one half norm uh, on the interior. Then you use the fact that uh, because it's an L2 projection, that's going to give you a uh, half power of H if you use uh, H2 norm of U star in, in the interior. So in the end, it gives you that difference bounded by H2 norm of U star times h norm of u so because in the h norm of v we have minus half power this plus one half power becomes plus one power so we have this and if you divide by the h norm of v we're going to have h in front of u, uh, h2 norm of the u star okay so now we just put everything together so Strang's second lemma says that the error of the Galerkin solution in this H norm is bounded by the error of the best approximation in the H norm plus that consistency term that we know it's uh, or proportional to H. Now it remains to see how this behaves. So just let's write the definition. This behaves like the gradient plus minus H to the power minus half times the uh, norm on the boundary of the error. Uh, U star is zero on the boundary, so this is basically just the norm of our discrete approximation along the boundary. So we choose, because there is an infimum, we can choose anything we want. Let's choose a uh, scott zang type uh, interpolant of U star. Then the uh, difference between the gradients or the error in the H1 semi-norm behaves like H to bound this L2 norm of the approximation on the boundary, let's look at this picture here. In the scott zang projection, let's say we set the boundary value of V to be zero along this line, meaning that we choose V to be zero on the vertices, then V is going to be zero along this line. And if we choose H to be sufficiently small, we can see that the distance between this green line and this curved edge is going to be of order h squared because there is going to be a point at which the curve is tangent to the green line so the distance is going to be h squared so uh, we just simply bound the l2 norm of v squared by the maximum value of the derivative of v times h squared that is the distance here and this is the value squared 
times the length of the boundary that will give you a bound on this norm here and then we use because v is a discrete function we use inverse inequality to bound the l2 l infinity norm by l2 norm for that we lose uh, one power of h so you, we're going to have h cubed here and l2 norm squared of the gradient here we use the stability of the scott zang projection so we get h1 norm of u star with h cubed in front uh, then that gives us uh, on the left hand side we have the h norm we write it explicitly h1 semi norm of the error plus l2 norm of the discrete solution on the boundary weighted by negative power of h it behaves like h by the way look here now we take the square root of that this is going to be h3 over 2 and because there is a negative half here over here we're going to have again uh, one h so it basically says that the h1 semi norm behaves like h and the l2 norm of the discrete solution over the boundary behaves like h to the power 3 over 2 so it has slightly faster conversions than the gradient this is the correct order actually uh, here I want to give you an exercise where now Nietzsche's method is applied to treat the same boundary value problem but with inhomogeneous boundary condition. In that case, it, what we need to do is we just need to change the right hand side a little bit. Uh, actually, there is something missing here. We of course need to add the right hand side that we already had. So this is the original one and we just have to modify it by some boundary term that this is going to work.